Hello and welcome to Knock Knock High with the Glockenfleckens. I am Will Flannery, also known as Dr. Glockenflecken. And I am Kristen Flannery, also known as Lady Glockenflecken. We are thrilled to have you here with us today. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our show here. Um, We are talking today with a general surgeon. And I've been thinking about new characters lately. Mm -hmm, For your skit? I already have. Yeah, I already have a general surgeon. I I recently did... A um a, a sleep medicine doctor mm. that was that was the latest new character, uh, which there's still props up around the office. Um, yeah, there sure are. With, that I used during that. That skit. was perhaps your most ridiculous costume. costume it was. So I had far. like the old timey uh, sleep hat and mm-hmm. a, a little fake candle to, to carry yeah. around. And but, the and the nightgown, which I that's that true. was the my nightgown. contribution. I was pretty proud of that. <laughs> it was pretty good. It was an incredibly uncomfortable night ground. Night ground. <laughs> Felt like sandpaper. Um, but the reason I bring this up is because for a long time, uh, people have been asking for a veterinarian. Mm-hmm. And I'm now thinking that maybe it's time to do it because mm-hmm. that is all I've been thinking about lately <laughs> yes. is medical care for dogs because our wonderful, sweet, kind of dumb, very inbred, standard poodle who we rescued about a year and a half ago has horrible diarrhea (laughs) and it's it's been my life for like the last three days Mm -hmm. uh it's like constantly like just paying attention to his movements around the house like Mm -hmm. what is he doing right where is he going because he won't tell us when he needs to go out he just he is is... he has very subtle hints he's not like a obvious like i'm gonna he doesn't stand, stand by, by the, the door. He doesn't whine. He doesn't paw at you. He doesn't, he just. He does very little things. Like he'll come at and, you. he'll look at me. He'll come rest his chin right on my leg. Sometimes, Sometimes, if you're lucky. But then other times he just goes to our most expensive rug and takes a giant dump on it yep. because he can't hold it anymore. I feel bad because he's like, he's trying. Yeah. I just... came in the other day and normally when you come in the door, he greets you very excitedly as dogs tend to do. And this day he just stood there and his little tail wagged a little bit, but not nearly to the full extent that he usually, you know. It's like he was afraid to move. He wa- Right. And so he was acting weird. I don't know if we've we've mentioned this on the podcast, but he recently had a seizure also and so i was a little concerned you know i was like oh this is kind of odd behavior is another seizure coming on but no it just turned out that you, you he was afraid to walk because immediately when i said do you need to go outside he bolted and just was so excited went over to where his leash was and i was like okay and so i got him outside and then immediately painted the town brown yeah it was it's just awful. And you know what? I have never been more pleased with my decision, you know, my negotiating a, terms yes. around getting this we dog. We made a deal. We made I a deal. I never, I did not want another thing to keep alive. I love the dog. Don't get me wrong. He's a very sweet dog. It's my dog. I just dog. My dog. did not want to be responsible for another thing. And so I said, we can get this dog, but I am doing nothing for its caretaking. This is not my job. This is your job and the children's job. And I got to say, I'm, I'm pretty pleased about that right now. I am not so pleased. <laughs> it, has, it, has, it has been a challenge mentally, physically. I have scrubbed more things. Olfactorily. Than I the, the care to admit. And um, it's, uh, you know, having a dog is sometimes the most amazing thing in the world. It can also lead to your darkest days. <laughs> you really... That's the where one, I am right now. One day, oh, this really encapsulates the whole thing. You came home from work on Friday. You had gotten home early. You were all excited. You're ready to see the kids, start your weekend. You take one step in the door and you step in a pile of poo. And then you follow that pile. There's just a trail. And there's, what, nine, ten piles total? It was, that was the that first day of it. It was bad. An hour and a half cleaning up. If you were upstairs in our house, you would have just heard, ah! <laughs> there was a lot of swearing happening downstairs. Oh, yeah. man. It's been bad. 
so we're gonna get, get all sorts our, of comments, you know, yeah, from so, people giving us suggestions. So guys, we've heard the suggestions. We're doing all we're the working things. On okay, it. we're we're you know we're we've done everything. We're doing the bland diet. We just, Pumpkin, you know, a little bit of just, medicine. Yeah. Like we're we're fine. Everything's good. He's gonna be just fine. But he's just. But but you may not. I I might be a, a scarred from this experience. He seems to be taking it all in stride. Yeah, eating, drinking, playing, uh, just uh, you know, between the the very frequent dumps. That's all. <laughs> but um, let's get to our guest here. Uh, enough Shall about we? our terrible experience. It is relevant. Diarrhea. I mean, it's been, it's we talked it a lot of colorectal we are, stuff yes, today because again, our guest today, uh, uh, which you guys all know him as Dr. Curran on TikTok, uh, all over social media. He's got a huge following, like over 5 million followers on on TikTok or even more. Uh, He does a lot of wonderful videos um, debunking myths in medicine and giving lots of like wonderful advice. You know, he's a, he's a surgeon uh, in the national health service over in the UK and he's a lecturer at Sunderland university. Uh, He's um, uh, just a very accomplished uh, physician, and surgeon. also a really engaging communicator. Yeah, and yeah. Just makes things really accessible and has a lot of creative and um, humorous terminology that makes his videos really fun. <laughs> he's he's amassed over five million followers on TikTok and elsewhere, and um, and so definitely check out his stuff on social media. He also has a new podcast. It's called The Referral with Dr. Curran, and uh, he also has a book coming out later this year called This Book May Save Your Life. Look for it in December of 23. Uh, We had a wonderful conversation with him. So let's get to it. Here is Dr. Curran. Dr. Curran, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I I will tell you that the TikTok algorithm just recently sent me a video of yours about an eargasm. So um, very good. You know, it's a nice little catchy way to get me to keep watching. That's it's it's. I love it. <laughs> you, you really yeah. got something good there. Have you? Are you an orgasmer or are you a coffer? Uh, I, I've I, honestly, I don't know. Yeah. Have I, you ever used a well, Q-tip in your life? I don't think he. I, not in my ears because I yeah. I, th- I feel like I've been conditioned from medical training to yeah. to never put a Q-tip in my ears. Yeah. So I, I will say I don't think I'm a coffer. So I I think I'm probably okay. more of an as weird as it sounds to say, an eargasmer. You never know until you find out. <laughs> what about you, Kristen? What? Are you? I, oh, you, I you, don't you, know. you never. I you've never watched coughed. You've this never. video. So, yeah. So, so tell us because I'm sitting here talking about we're talking about eargasms. Because uh, 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 Kristen has not seen this not. video. So, no. so <laughs> why don't you inform our audience what we're, what on earth we're talking about here? Yeah, I mean, I came across this video that uh, one of my followers sent me on TikTok where some TikToker was sticking a Q-tip in their ear and was making these pleasurable expressions and moaning noises and explaining, you know, in her words, uh, why did nature put a happy button in their ear? So that's why we should be using Q-tips, you know, to pleasure this happy button. And I kind of, you know, dug into this phenomenon a bit more. Yeah, and it seems like there is, for a small percentage of the population, um, some pleasurable sensation which occurs when you stimulate the inner ear, hence eargasm. It's a erogenous zone, apparently. And yeah, I made a video about it and uh, came to your husband's uh, view. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, that that video is probably causing Q-tip sales to skyrocket. But I don't I don't know if you're uh, you might not be an ENT doctor's favorite no, no. person right now no, no. probably <laughs> <Right>. not <laughs> mm-hmm. i feel like for me it's more of like it like it scratches an itch it feels like an itch yeah well yeah, I yeah think but I mean, too. And it feels good that it's like but in the but in the same way that like scratching like, like a dog you know okay Where if you scratch the dog deer and then kind of lean into it like that well, you're giving that dog quite a bit of pleasure whenever you do that well I suppose. <laughs> Okay, I don't like where this is going. <laughs> but this is this is a, a, a you brought something up though that that I've found interesting in my own like content creation, because whenever I I started on you know doing ophthalmology, I just assumed like I'm never gonna have to even think about anything below the neck like ever again, and then I start putting together all these videos where I'm trying to talk about nephrology and cardiology, and all of a sudden like I find myself like reading 
research articles, not for the like the knowledge, but just for the the trying to, to sound find the, like you have yeah. knowledge. To sound like I know what I'm talking about. I'm <laughs> sure it's the same right? for you. Yeah. Right. Right. It's for, it's for the content. So you're a surgeon. You know, you're, yeah. You're. He you're probably pro- still remembers a lot more than you do. Probably. I will surgeon. give you that. <laughs> no, I, I I agree with you. I mean, so I've always been interested in education, and when I started using social media more for public health purposes, health literacy of just the lay person. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm never going to teach a room full of cardiologists about pediatric tetralogy of fallow and any weird congenital conditions, but I would back myself as maybe knowing slightly more than the average member of public about a certain medical thing, or at least be able to find out the information to explain it simply. So it does help me somewhat keep up to date with current trends and uh, updates in medicine. And it's interesting learning about things outside of my wheelhouse, which is general surgery and intestines and stuff. Um, But yeah, it's definitely similar to you. You know, reading up on things which I thought I'd never have to touch again uh, is still quite useful. And I think I, I quite enjoy it. So what what it was a few years back that you started your TikTok channel, which now has amassed like five million followers. Um, so a huge audience. Uh, and I assume it was around the time of the pandemic when when you started making content. Is that is that about uh, right? Yes. Or is so, it before that? Uh, so on TikTok, I started around end of 2019 and just leading into the pandemic is when, you know, things started picking up for me when people were locked down. But I actually started my whole YouTube journey in 2012 when I was still a medical student. Uh, I was making videos, Mm. a final year medical student. I was making videos uh, about how to do an abdominal examination, how to do a respiratory examination. Um, So that kind of stuff I was doing back then, but with very little growth, traction, or engagement. Um, I had like a little Mm. cult following of maybe, you know, 10,000 people watching my videos, but Weirdly enough, the videos I was making back then, you know, how to do a cranial nerve examination, it fell into some weird ASMR playlist on YouTube. Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, and then people loved it. And I, I was like, yeah, it's getting, you know, this video of me doing a bimanual vaginal examination on a pelvic model dummy has got, you know, this many views. And then I look at the comments and it's all like, uh, oh, yeah, do that again, doctor, and stuff like that. So I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah. The internet is a weird place. <laughs> yeah. I I have also found myself in the ASMR by accident wheelhouse. <laughs> that, that's, huh. that's happened to me a couple times. <laughs> uh, there's there's a uh, I think there's a lot of people that uh, kind of like the the inner ear erogenous zone. It's kind of like a, a. Oh, I wonder if those an, are the same I don't people. Know if it's the same. Yeah. <laughs> Here, there you go. Look, we're already There's a finding, research question for someone we're out there. Already finding research projects for med <laughs> students here. All right. You know, you know I literally uh, so you know this whole new threads thing that's come up now, threads yes. app. I posted something on threads just based on the ear video saying because uh, when I was looking at the ear, the sexy ear literature, which of which there is very little, um, <laughs> I was looking at the incidence of people who get eargasm versus get a cough reflex and there wasn't much out there so i just posted a question for maybe epidemiological purposes i said hey how many of you guys um you know when you stick something in your ear get an orgasm or nothing or a cough or both just to collect data on this and i got an email from two medical students the same day saying i just saw you posted this thing are you interested in doing a, a data on this at, or a paper on this i'll be happy to assist you so yeah there, there's loads of potential That's for amazing. research based on what we do on social media there you That's... go. You're going to be a, a full professor of social media before yeah. before long, my friend. <laughs> and so you're you're uh, you know you're a surgeon, and I just I think it's fascinating that that you uh, found the time to to or or the desire to leave the operating room to start making content. Uh, uh, so uh, le- <laughs> yeah, you you know. Um... Leave the operating room, meaning, oh, so I'm still a full-time surgeon. Um, I, I actually meant that, it, you know, you, you actually left physically the operating room to go and do something else because we know that, that surgeons have, have a problem with not operating at times. Um, and, and so do you find it hard to keep that balance, to find that? Uh, because, you know, the more you do something like 
create a social media presence, the more it can take over your life. And so, um, is it, do you find that challenging to, to, to keep that balance? And do you feel yourself being pulled either back toward mostly doing medicine or thinking, Hey, you know, maybe it might be time to cut back on practicing and, and do more of the social media outreach. Yeah, no, it's a really good question and something which I've struggled with in my head and I've gone one way then the other way so many times. Um, when I first started out on social media, I really underestimated how much of a career it actually is. I mean, it's a, it's a career in its own right. And I used to almost look upon influencers, you know, these kind of full-time influencers quite uh, condescendingly. I think, oh, it's such an easy job. But then growing a following of, you know, X million followers I begin to realize it is a full-time consuming juggernaut of a thing that you need a whole team for sometimes. Um, and I thought, wow, I, I can't juggle these two careers. And definitely, I think at some point in the future, maybe 10 years or 15 years, uh, you know, when I'm a little bit more tired of surgery and things like that, I might cut down on the surgery stuff. But for me, I, I still really enjoy you know, going into work, operating on people. And, you know, people talk about purpose in life. And without sounding mm -hmm. too cheesy, I, I do actually enjoy the immediacy of seeing someone with a problem, say appendicitis, or they've got a big hernia or a gallbladder issue, and you remove the offending organ or you fix something. And then the next day, they feel great. I still love that rush of like adrenaline or dopamine or whatever it is that gives yeah. you that satisfaction or hope surgery. So, for the moment, I think I'll try to juggle both somehow, but yeah. I, I, I'm kind of in the same boat. Except in the U.S., you know, a lot of a lot of uh, physicians are thinking about leaving, but it's mostly f because of the healthcare system and how it treats, uh, you know, patients and doctors. So I guess uh, my next question for you is, how's the NHS treating you? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> that's, that's a whole, it's like a, it's like a whole crate of worms right yeah. there. Something with a cat. Do you have the Fifth Amendment or something similar in the UK? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if not, you can borrow ours. <laughs> yeah. So the um, the the NHS there. I mean, with every with most healthcare systems in the world, there are flaws, there are positives, and I think you know, working in one system makes you acutely aware of the flaws more so than someone looking from the outside in, like. You know, a lot of people, when I post about content about the NHS or how it's sometimes struggling with underfunding, et cetera, I'll get people from other countries saying, oh, you should look at America or you should look at so-and-so. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's not great, but I'm so aware over the last decade how it's deteriorated as well. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people. So this, this is a, there's an interesting stat that I found about, uh, you know, trainees in general in the UK, doctor trainees. So in 27... Uh, 2017, 70% uh, of junior doctors, after completing their first two years of rotations, continued on to higher training, whether they were family doctors or physicians or surgeons or whatever it was, right? In 2022, that number dropped from 70% to 30%. So only 30% of doctors, after completing their first two years of general rotations, were continuing on into training. The rest were either quitting mm. medicine, quitting training, or leaving to greener pastures, uh, you know, to Canada or Australia or New Zealand. So that wow. that itself, uh, you know, shows you what is happening in the NHS. Yeah, and it's uh, you know, I, I hear the same thing when I post about the U.S. healthcare system. I think it's it's really important though that we have uh, physicians, people that are they're entrenched in the whatever medical system you're working in that you talk about it on social media. So I, I think it's great, you know, just just pointing out what what's good about it, what's bad about it, the flaws, the things that could be better. Um, and it's, it's not to compare yours to somebody else's. It's just like, hey, the public, people may not know what we're dealing with here. And we don't, they don't know why this happens, why this bill isn't paid for, why you have a prior authorization for whatever it is. Uh, and, um, and so shedding light on that, regardless of whatever medical system you're in, I think is hugely important. I think social media is also really important for, you know, for physicians to be on right now and, and other kinds of, you know, clinically trained scientists, because there's so much 
like health and wellness, the whole wellness industry, right? There's so much <laughs> misinformation out there and people trying to profit off of the misinformation, um, even among people that seem like they might, you know, be experts in it. And I don't, I don't know, I just feel like there's a lot of really convincing snake oil salesmen out there right now. So it's more important than ever, I think, for people who actually have, a you know, the medical yeah. training and the expertise to be there and to be educating the public and in a way that is accessible to the general person, not just having all this information hidden in medical journals. Yeah. And you know, you hit the nail on the head there. It's those ones who are seemingly innocuous and, you know, very authentic and professional are the ones that are most dangerous. You know, you get right. these kind of, uh, you know, wellness gurus who clearly look like, you know, they've, literally, you know, made their own PDF of their degree and, you know, talk about um, chakras and, you know, crystals and really weird things. Or, you know, the Gwyneth Paltrow School of Goop. Like, you know, mm -hmm. there's that school, which That's obviously right. everyone laughs at and debunks, right? But then there's those kind of like maybe a plastic surgeon who looks the part and is like doing the good things or, you know, some cardiologist is doing the right things. And then... They get this amazing following and then they sell you their course or some dodgy supplements or something like that. And then you're like, damn, you've got a huge audience and now you're funneling them to some crap. Yes. Right. And that's what I, you, you've been really good about, about you know, finding those people and, and just, just pointing out the, the fallacies, the arguments, the, the things that just are not good medicine that they're talking about. And I, I imagine that once you started making that type of content, just like the floodgates just mm, came out, just opened up because <laughs> because I, all of your followers they send you everything like you get I'm sure you get tagged and like every every one of these types of snake oil uh, well, things all of that are being sold their followers too probably it's probably both right your followers saying yay keep up the great work here's another example and then all of the snake oil salesman's followers saying no no this know, is actually how dare you this helped this helped my second cousin from right. my first you know aunt i don't know yeah you know it's probably get a lot of a <laughs> lot of both kinds of mail <laughs> you know that's that you know that's the thing like i think when you take on the challenge of debunking something online particularly when you are trying to debunk a video from someone with a large following online and maybe a following that's even larger than your own you do run the risk of exposing yourself to like a sort of a lynch mob where yeah. you know those zealots from someone who follows their, you know, keto diet burning plan or whatever, then come for you, <laughs> right. uh, you know, so you do run that risk. But, and I've found actually over my few years on TikTok on the short format social media, where things can be construed and taken out of, misconstrued and taken out of context in those kind of things, you need to throw a line between almost debunking something with science, but not bullying or belittling that person um and you know because you don't want to then start going along the lines and i've seen a lot of creators do this like good creators who debunk stuff almost start to um you know defame that person's character rather than the content you know they kind of right. belittle the person how they look or what they're trying to do and their whole personality rather than just the the science and i think you need to almost be very careful in the battles you pick because you can almost be this pariah where, you know, you are a self-proclaimed police online and you just make enemies right. with all these people. Right. And we don't need to like continue the tribalism. <laughs> We're trying to yeah. bridge it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Avoid the ad hominem attacks. Yeah. And, and I know. think that's really important to focus on the science because I think that a lot of people out there in the general public you know, have just enough education in biology or chemistry or what have you, uh, that they, what those people are saying or selling sounds like it might make sense, right? And they, and they feel like, okay, this makes sense to me, so I'm going to give it a shot. And they might not know that it doesn't unless they hear the, the good science from someone else. And then, you know, that will make more sense to them of why the good science you know, is what it is and, and why this bad science is bad. And I think a lot of people, probably the majority of people are somewhere, they're not the zealots, right? They're just the general public that has a general education and they just need better information. Yeah, I, I think 
I was doing this, um, uh, an example of this was I was doing a talk recently for the NHS talking about the responsible use of social media. And I was giving this talk to probably a room of 150 NHS big wigs and leaders, you know, these really very old consultants who probably had never used social media before. And some of the examples I gave of positive examples of why social media can be used for good. Um, and during the, you know, the research for making that PowerPoint presentation, I just searched my name online to see, you know, what came up. Hey, I, I recommend never searching your name online. Yeah. But <laughs> that's, 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 that's dang, dangerous. Was, I was on this, I was like, uh, the title of this Reddit thread. And that's you know, usually not a good thing. Yeah. But this one was okay because it says, uh, Dr. Curran debunks vaccine myths. And I looked into it. And this person, the original poster, the OP, had posted a link to a vac COVID vaccine video that I'd done uh, very early on in the pandemic talking about the science of why and how it works, the mRNA vaccine. And this person's blurb was along the lines of, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't too sure about taking the vaccines. I was really hesitant. But watching Dr. Curran's videos, he made it quite simple. He wasn't condescending. And there was no pressure. And it made sense. So I've taken the vaccine now. So that almost oh, validates the stuff you're doing online. Right. And, you know, it's just one person. But that one person could explain the same thing to 10 people. And then, you know, who explained to another 10 people. So the kind of R number of the health virus is a good one. Right. Mm. Yeah, and that's just the one person who's commenting. For everyone that's commenting, there might be 10 that are doing the same thing and you just don't hear about it. But it is hard to to read negativity about you online. So how do you, because I've certainly faced that myself, how do you personally deal with that and not let it affect you or at least try not to let it affect you? Yeah, I think it's very difficult. Just like you said, it's um, it's never nice to hear or see something against your personality or something something you stand for. Um, and you know, it doesn't get a lot easier with experience. I mean, I still see the occasional you know, it could just be one comment in a sea of two hundred comments, you know, or which is just negative. And the direct the hundred other hundred ninety nine are positive. But you know, our human psychology narrows in on that one. And we think the world's ending and we're being canceled. Um, and I think it's just being aware that, you know, you, you know, you've also got millions of followers online. I've got millions of followers. And there's a reason that people followed us. You know, they've not just click follow just so they can hurl abuse at us. There may be some people who do that, but the majority of people have found some value. So I kind of take that uh, perspective of there's a reason I, you know, gained a following doing what could be considered, you know, boring videos. I'm talking about science and health and medicine, which isn't a traditional route to growing on social media before 2020 already. Um, so there's a reason that this type of content has engaged with people. So even if I see that negative comment, you know, I think, you know, it can't please everyone. So you grow mm. thick skin and, you know, we're, we're both in medicine. We know you got to have a degree of thick skin. So I think that helps with just being exposed to the constant low grade negativity, you just tend to ignore it over time. Do you, uh, you're a, um, an educator and do you, uh, train, you know, I don't know, registrars, is that what that's what, like the, the equivalent of a red, a an resident attending. in the U S yeah. I so, oh. um, right. Registrars. Equivalent students. we have is like registrars and senior house officers and foundation gotcha. doctors who are like the juniors. Are you? Yeah, that's right. So I always struggle with that. I feel like I've heard the terminology so many times. I still can't get it right. Um, do you? So are you're you're training the next generation of doctors? Do you have them in your operating rooms and you're you know you're giving lectures to them? Correct? Is that right? Yeah. So uh, you know there'll be um, depending on the caseload that's there, they'll go. We'll, you know I can take them through depending on their level, um, mm -hmm. maybe parts of certain operations. So if it's a you know a, a straightforward uh, laparoscopic appendicectomy, a keyhole surgery to remove someone's appendix. Um, I can take a, a, a training um, registrar or a training SHO through the case. Um, and then if it's someone even more junior, there may be a small part of the case I may let them do or just teach them yeah. how to close the skin. So it all depends on that. And that, that's also like a different type of education, which I really enjoy. Actually. Yeah. And so I was going to ask how, how you how you approach social media whenever you're mentoring and educating? Do you, I assume the people that you're, you're educating, they're aware of your social, 
your online presence. What yeah. advice do you have for them? How does that play into your 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 day job, I'll say? Yeah, I thought it would play a bigger part in terms of how it would maybe cause barriers or obstacles, but actually, you know, you've probably experienced the same. When people recognize you in the hospital, your colleagues that work with you, it's, you know, usually almost always favorable. You know, it's, it's reviewed and looked upon uh, with approval and they like that. And actually, even when I'm in the operating room, you know, the, the scrub nurses and the, the runners and the uh, operating department practitioners and the anesthetists, they usually always aware that, hey, this guy is on social media or I like your videos, whatever. And just from a training perspective as well, I actually find it doesn't affect negatively how I train things. And in fact, being online, making videos, I would say anecdotally or certainly, you know, objectively for me, it's improved my communication skills. And as a mm -hmm. trainer to junior doctors and junior surgeons, that communication is key. So, you know, I, I've had some good trainers and some bad trainers in my career. So I know what to avoid and, you know, what to try and improve on. So um, communicating with that junior, how to, you know, do certain things, how to improve. Uh, I think that always helps. And, you know, people kind of look towards me as a mentor almost because they see me so often online. They feel like they know me. Mm. You know, it's kind of a weird parasocial relationship. So, yeah. you know, even people I, I've met for the first time, they get really comfortable with hanging out with me in the operating room or somewhere. And I think yeah, that's in my favor and in their favor as well. I wonder if there will, you know, before too long, if, if social media, you know, as a doctor will be part of the medical education. And if there will be, you know, people like you that are, that are involved in actually teaching the younger generation of doctors how to be on social media as part of the medical curriculum. Yeah. I, I, I think that a hundred percent needs to be a thing. I, that's like such an accurate and such a well-made point because um, if you think now the current generation of medical students, almost all of them have some online presence, right? And if you look at the kind of like older generation, you know, 10 years above them who are at the end of their training or towards the end or already, you know, attendings or consultants in the UK, they generally don't have social media presences. I mean, you would be probably the rarity in your cohort, right? Um, but almost every medical student, they've got an Instagram profile, or TikTok profile. So yeah, we do need some safeguarding or education on safe use of social media. Sure. Yeah. Well, let's take a, a quick break and we'll be right back with Dr. Kern. Hey, Kristen, do you know why a stethoscope is so hard to use? Um, because there's no heartbeat in an eyeball. That's actually a really good point. Uh -huh. But also the heart is quiet. The, mm -hmm. the, the sounds are somewhat distant and sometimes you're in a noisy environment and you're trying to listen mm -hmm. to all the, the beeps and boops and whatever other noises there are in the heart. Uh, but with Echo Health's 3M Litman Core Digital Stethoscope, it's easier than ever. You get 40 times sound amplification, mm -hmm. active background noise cancellation, Honestly, even an ophthalmologist could figure it out. I also really could have used one of those before I had to do 10 minutes of CPR on you. Yeah. It leads to earlier detection, better outcomes, something that's definitely meaningful for us. And we have a special offer for our U.S. listeners. Visit echohealth.com slash KKH and use code NOC50 to experience Echo's digital stethoscope technology. That's E-K-O health slash KKH and use NOC50 to get $50 off, plus a free case, plus free engraving with this exclusive offer. All right, now we're back with Dr. Kern. And Kern, you you gave us a few, um, we always like it when guests bring stories, especially uh, stories from their early years as a physician or as a student. And um and so you you gave us some fantastic examples here. So I, I we always love a good rectal exam story. <laughs> Do we? So could you? Well, maybe I'll just speak for myself. Uh, but uh, enlighten us, please. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this was this was very awkward for me, and um, you know, it was it was a learning point. You know, I, I see every uh, rectal exam as a learning point. And this certainly was. So this was when I was a second year medical student. Uh, and I was on my first ever surgical block. And at this point, 
I'd already almost told myself that I want to become a surgeon. I didn't know what type of surgeon, but I knew I wanted to do something with my hands. So I was really eager and excited for this. Now, um, the attachment I was on was in general surgery, you know, the thing that I happened to go on. And we were on a ward round with this senior colorectal consultant deals with bowel-related stuff and bowel cancers. And he had just, um, you know, I think a week ago operated on this patient we were seeing now on the ward round. And he asked me, he looked around the sort of the, the ward, uh, the round, and it was me and another medical student. And he said, you boy, and he pointed to me, and there's a really old school surgeon, like classic <laughs> dinosaur stereotype surgeon. He's like, you boy, um, you boy, examine this patient now. And I said, yes, sir. And I was examining the patient, did the abdominal exam, everything. And then the patient who knew the, the surgeon really well, they were kind of like, you know, you know, best buddies, you know, they were thick as these. Um, the patient called the, you know, the consultant, the surgeon by his first name said, Steve, I think he should do a rectal exam. And then the surgeon said, oh, yes, good idea. Do a rectal exam now and tell me what you find. And I obviously saw this patient had a stoma, had a major operation through the, you know, the, the clips in the middle of the wound. And so, you know, I was doing the rectal exam and I went down to, you know, get the patient in position, do the exam. And the, ho- the bottom was sewn up. There was no hole. There was no rectum. There was no anus. It was just like a, like a teddy bear with stitches, you know, like a Barbie butt. And I later found out, well, that day I, I looked up, you know, it's something called colloquially called by patients, Barbie butt surgery, where the entire anus and rectum is removed. Oh, it? really? Patients call it that? Yeah, Barbie butt <laughs> surgery. They love to love- get that. Yeah. That's so awesome. I was That's like, so wow. funny. I was, I was like, uh, uh, I, was shocked. I, never- I, was like, I couldn't hide my just <laughs> I was like, what is going on? I, they I didn't really set you up for that, pieces. didn't they? <laughs> and were they cracking up because they were in on the joke? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, that was um, that was very nice of your supervising uh, surgeon to yeah. put you through that. <laughs> oh boy! Well, yeah, but I mean, uh, yeah. actually, that that's a good segue into our game today. Oh, perfect! Uh, because uh, I'm scared. Uh, Barbie butt syndrome, or whatever it is, um, is uh, a, 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 just one of the numerous interesting phrases you'll hear from Dr. Kern's videos. So I actually have a list of phrases that have appeared in your videos, okay? Yes. And these are out of context. So I'm going to say a phrase, and I want Kristen to try to guess what that is referring to. Oh, that is going to be fun. (laughs) This is going to be fun. (laughs) And if she can't, you have to tell me, do you even remember saying this in one of your videos? Okay. 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 Oh, boy. (laughs) <laughs> Here's the first one. Um, Louis Vuitton colon. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, oof. Louis Vuitton is like a fancy colon, a rich person colon. <laughs> That's a good guess. Um, handbag colon. <laughs> someone carrying maybe... your colon on your arm. Um, <laughs> maybe someone who's who's just uh, spends a lot of money on their colon. Oh uh, yeah, could be right. Do you sort remember? Of, yeah describing this i do actually i do remember this it's relatively recently um so you were you were on the right tra- track there Kristen. it's uh it's it is a fancy colon um, okay it was a video i did on um a melanosis coli where the the colon is tattooed it's got this leopard print style pattern to it if someone like you know chronically i would never have guessed slack- tattooed colon <laughs> oh it's wild you need to look up uh, not Louis Vuitton colon, but melanosis coli. It's incredible. It's incredible. There you and go. It, okay, wait, but what is the purpose of doing this? Oh, you don't do it voluntarily. Well, it's not something you control, but if you take like, if you chronically abuse senna laxatives, like senicides, uh, your It'll, colon um, starts yeah. getting tattooed with this like these black pigments. And it looks like a leopard print, like the kind of Louis Vuitton style. You're forgiven for thinking people would voluntarily get their I colon mean, tattooed because they do it for their eye. They do all so sorts of things. why yes. not? That's true. And that's what this podcast has taught me is that it's just... People will do They anything. do the weirdest things. Okay. All right. Here's the next one. Okay. And I, I have a feeling we're sticking with the colon theme for a little while here. Well, you know. Um, <laughs> tufted tailpipe. <laughs> 
This feels related to, to Barbie what? butt surgery. <laughs> what is but a maybe tufted a, tailpipe? A tufted tailpipe. Okay. Oh, boy. I would think it's, the, it's interior. Okay. It'd be part of, part of the colon or the rectum. Uh, and how, and how, you've, how, you've how, had to yeah. sew it in such a way that it's become tufted. Like kind of a... Like, like pillowed in little pieces. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great... <laughs> like bubble wrap. That's a great guess. <laughs> Uh, so I I meant it to mean like as tuft is like a you know like a tuft of hair. So a hairy oh, butt, okay. tufted tailpipe. You know the tailpipe oh. is the you know, the end. This uh, hairy might be butt. like a like a a language I issue between America and the UK. Anybody listening, if you have a hairy butt, you don't. You have a tufted tailpipe. That's right. That's a that's a. That much, sounds so much cuter. That's a much yeah, fancier way. You're a rabbit. You know. Yeah. All right. Here's the next one. <laughs> Cheeky tingle. Ooh, cheeky tingle. Cheeky tingle. Well, it, well, okay, so cheeky, I'm guessing, doesn't mean your cheek. It probably Could means be. like the, the well, UK cheeky. Maybe, or what? Or it might be cheeks. I don't know which cheeks you're talking about. Oh, oh, well, I, I'm going to, uh, you just gave it away then, just some butt cheeks. <laughs> uh, your, your butt cheeks are tingling? Maybe. I don't Some know. nerve pain. <laughs> I I don't remember the specific video, but cheeky tingle. I think like a little unexpected, you know, thing. Like little woo! unexpected like, tingle. Like, yeah, one of those. Maybe, maybe, maybe a little paresthesia of the, yeah. the perianal area of the body. Who knows? Um, honestly, some of these I don't really know the context. I had help with this. So. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. Here's yes. another. One. Okay. Uh, Endometrial prison. <laughs> Do you remember saying this? Endometrial prison. Um, is that like, what would be the opposite of a euphemism? Like a bad, it's it's a bad connotation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. There's a word for that. But anyway, is that is it referring to a womb? Yes. The, yes. <laughs> yes. The uterus, which is where the endometrium is found. Yes. But that's the idea is that your womb is an endometrial prison for the fetus. Oh. Is that it? it? Does she nail it? it? Hey, hey. Yo, jail babies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. What was the context of that? <laughs> so there was this video that I found online where this guy was sh like trying to freak people out about how babies look on MRI scans. You know, like they look really freaky <laughs> on MRI mm -hmm. scans. And then I just showed several more ultrasounds and CTs and MRIs where the babies look like, you know, evil aliens inside, you know, and I said, quote, endometrial prisons. Like these little babies are trapped inside this womb and they're waiting to be paroled, you know, their kind of due date. So yeah, I just went with it. <laughs> if, if you haven't been convinced yet to watch this guy's videos, <laughs> know, right? like, please, please do it. All right, I got, I got, even unborn children are. Yeah. A, a, I think I think I think this one's a, a pretty obvious one, so we won't spend much time on it. Chocolate exit pipe. Oh dear, uh, that's uh, what uh, we're experiencing think, with our dog right now. I think. Oh my god, oh, we've got a, we've got a, a dog that has colitis. We've got a diarrhea situation going on in our house. <laughs> um, okay, all right, I got two more here. Um, post op snoo snoo. <laughs> I think that's how you say it. Did he yeah. say it correctly? Okay. Post op snoo snoo. You know this if you watch Futurama. Oh no, I don't. I, you I do. have watched Futurama. It's been a long time, so I don't remember the reference. Oh, post op. I don't even. Uh, there's no way. There's I, no way. Yeah. What so is post -op it? Post op after surgery and uh, yeah. snoo snoo refers to the act of coitus, sexual intercourse, because in the oh, Futurama right. episode there were these that's Amazonian right. women. Who you know said death by snoo snoo? You know they would kill any weaker <laughs> men by just having sex with them. So that's where snoo snoo came about. Oh, from. stop snoo snoo! All right, I love it. That's great. Okay, last one. Nose boner. <laughs> okay. Um, We've already talked about ear boners. Which, that's true. How about a nose boner? Uh, is it just like a really good smell, like your grandmother's cookies. <laughs> oh God! No. Boners and grandmothers no. do not. No, the same that's not good. Here. No good. <laughs> the cookies. I don't think it has to be from your grandmother, but yeah. you know. <laughs> oh. um, okay, so that's not it. What is it? So yeah, similar to your ears and the genitalia, your nose actually has erectile tissue, which is for 
conserving water and it's part of the nasal cycle. So when it swells up and engorges, you get a nose boner. There you go. You wow. learned something new. Yeah. A nose boner. So you, know, you, know, you know, like um, when you feel that one nostril feels like blocked, that's because the yeah. erectile tissue, oh. the turbinate, is engorged and it's kind of swollen up then. And that's the kind of... Your, that's you what got, it feels like I to have a nose see. boner? Yeah. I am not a fan of nose no. boners. No. That's no fun. That is, is that like when at night it's harder to breathe through your nose than in the morning? Because So we uh, all maybe. have nose boners all the time. Like as part of the nasal cycle, we're only, most people breathe through one nostril at one time and it switches over every kind of couple of hours or so with a dominant nostril. So the non-dominant nostril, which is not involved in the breathing at that time, is the one with the boner because it all kind of swells up and the air is not preferentially going through that one. Can you get nasal erectile dysfunction? <laughs> I bet you can. Or you can just yeah. breathe better. You probably, I'm sure That's you can. That's another paper. That's another study for any medical go. students out there. You there you think. go. Does, why would we have that? Why does, why, evolutionarily, why on earth did that develop? I questioned um, this as well. And um, <laughs> I found it was for water conservation. So it maintains the humidity in our nasal passages. Okay. Oh, all right. All right. There you go. And I guess, uh, you know, the, the bad thing is you're not able to breathe very well during sex. So. I guess so. Assuming it, it, the, that the nasal, you know what? Let's just move on. I think. Yeah, I, I don't think, know that they're I think, correlated. I don't think we need to, to belabor <laughs> um, the erectile tissue of the na nose anymore. Um, all right. Let's take one more quick break and we'll come back with Dr. Kern. Hey, Kristen, it's almost dinner time. I know. I'm hungry. Who's going to cook dinner? Not it. Uh, I guess it's me. But I don't like cooking. I'm not that like good at it. I don't like it either. But we have every plate now. Yeah. It's great. That it helps. makes It makes meal time so much easier. And it's really high quality stuff, too. Yeah. Yeah, like the other day, I made these Kung Pao beef bowls. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, better than I could have ever done on, on, your own, on my own. For sure. Absolutely. And the what the hard thing about cooking for me is like, you got to do it every day. Yeah. Multiple times. People have to eat every day. Yeah. Uh, but so annoying. every plate has big batch faves. Uh, it's, 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 you can cook a meal once and you can get multiple meals out of it. I yeah, love it. I like that. Or if you need to go to a party with a whole bunch of people and you're supposed to bring something. Yeah. There you go. And you can customize every plate meals as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you can swap in proteins and sides depending on what you like. Proteins, vegetables. It's Whatever great. Whatever you want. And it's got a lower price point. It's very competitively priced. That's true. That's always good. So get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49KKH. Again, that's just $1.49 per meal at everyplate.com slash podcast and enter code 49KKH. <laughs> All right, we are back with a fan story. So uh, we always encourage our listeners to send in their own medical stories because we love stories here. And so our story today, uh, and hopefully uh, I have not read this, and so we're all three of us here are hearing this for the first time. Uh, so this is this comes from the sleepy nurse. The sleepy nurse says um, she listened to our interview with Dr. Fitz Harris uh, and triggered a memory for her. In the course of my nursing career, I have only seen leeches used a handful of times. When I have seen them, they were used for free flaps. This is where surgeons, you know, Dr. Kern, you don't want to tell us what a free flap is? Yeah, I I'm mean, sure like you're probably aware. Flaps and grafts, when you take a piece of tissue from one area and you keep its blood supply, you transfer it to another area, and you use plastics and burn surgery. Exactly. So uh, there was once a patient on my unit, she says, with a with a free flap graft in his mouth. Guess where they put the leeches? But that was not where not nearly as bad as another patient I had with an amputated penis that was reattached. Oh boy. Oh boy. I can't imagine what those gentlemen went through, and I hope they are both doing okay. <laughs> Me too. I can't. Did they they put the leeches a leech in your on mouth. on the penis too? I don't. I guess you can put leeches. See, this is something that was new to me, actually, when we talked about this. Have you ever seen leeches used in a clinical setting? I've seen uh, leeches used when I did a rotation years ago in plastic surgery. I mean, the leeches were fantastic for the microvascular joints they did between blood vessels, but never 
in intimate areas like that. These were like on the chest or the arm. Um, but genitalia, that makes me cringe as well. What, wow. what is the, there was a movie. Was it Stand By Me? There's a, there's a movie. I have this flashbulb memory of a movie. Uh, I think that's the one where the kids are like going on like a. They see the dead body. running away or something. They, they go into like a swamp. Ugh. And they end up with leeches all of themselves, and one of oh, them like yeah, yeah, looks yeah. And down, yeah. and, and like he's got blood. Anyway, oh, right. Um, uh, so uh, the leech thing, I honestly thought that that I had no idea that that still happened. And yeah, we've yeah. gotten a lot of comments about that actually ever since yeah. that episode was released. Apparently, people have really like strong feelings about leeches. Are there? I don't know. So oh. do you just get them. Yeah. So um, as far as I'm aware, in the NHS anyway, in the, in the UK where I work. Once a leech has been used for one patient, it has to be destroyed um, for you know uh, public health purposes and for infectious infection control purposes because it's a biohazard. So anything that's a leech which has had its blood meal literally has to be incinerated. Uh, and also there are also maggot farms uh, where there's a, there's a maggot farm, medical grade maggot farm in Wales, where the NHS essentially get its entire supply of medical grade maggots for for wood healing um i feel like i need to update my advanced directive now (laughs) like please never use maggots on me oh no yeah it's 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 fine medical they're medical grade maggots they're fine (laughs) yeah (laughs) poor poor leeches yeah i know hey at least they they get a nice meal though right like final meal the you know last last supper kind of thing yeah that's request (laughs) Um, uh, all right. Well, I think that's a good note. We, we covered a lot of ground on this sure podcast did. episode. Um, so Dr. Curran, thank you so much for, uh, for talking with us. I know you got a couple of things. You got a podcast, you got a book coming up. Tell us all about and what's going on in your life right now, what you got coming up. Uh, yeah. So first of all, thank you so much, uh, you guys for having me on the podcast. It's great. I've been watching, you know, uh, your videos for, over a year, first on Twitter, and then when you started on TikTok and YouTube, I've been following you everywhere. So, like, it's a oh, great insight you. for me to know what's going on, you know, in medicine and like kind of healthcare politics in the US, but also mm. fun to know that the stereotypes are the same in America as the case. <laughs> yes. okay, so did love- I get the did I get the surgeon right? Is that but the surgeon you know- right? And the best is you got the uh, the emergency room doctors who are like slightly everywhere. Bang on! <laughs> yeah. But in in the in the UK, it's like the the anesthetists love the cycling. Um, oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, screw the anesthetist. I, I do hear that feedback actually from anesthetists here too. Like they was like, "Hey, they're not the only ones that like to ride a bike." I'm like, you know, I'm sorry, I only have one bike helmet. All right. So uh, yeah, so you, you you nail that. So I love <laughs> Thank those you. videos. Appreciate um, it. But yeah, I'm mean, glad that we got to connect. But in my life uh, right now, I spent the last 18 months or two years writing a book called "This Book May Save Your Life," which is coming out in December of this year, actually. So. Uh, it's going to be an exciting few months leading up to that. And um, awesome. yeah, just released a podcast, which I started um, about a month and a bit ago. Uh, it's called The Referral with Dr. Curran. I've literally, you know, we're like six episodes in, very early days. It's just like a, a go-to podcast for debunking myths and medical facts and hopefully tips to improve people's lives. Oh, I got to check cool. it out. And is that what the book is too, Debunking Myths? Uh, the book is really interesting. It's a combination of like history, medical history, which I love. And, you know, Dr. Fitaris, which you had on, that yes. inspired me. And um, also kind of personal anecdotes from my time as a medical student, as a doctor, you know, stories, weird, crazy stories, but also, you know, debunking stuff, but also health tips mm-hmm. that are science-based. So a mishmash of everything. And maybe a little bit on nose boners. I don't know. Uh, you know, there are nose find boners out. in the book. There are nose boners in the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely check it out. That's uh, called "This Book May Save Your Life," uh, and that's when is that? Uh, uh, December. December. It's coming out in December, right? Eighth. Yeah. All right. So check it out, and definitely follow uh, Dr. Kern on uh, TikTok, and you're on YouTube as well. Yeah, and I'm everywhere. Instagram, all, right. everywhere. all the places. All yeah. the places. Yeah. Threads now. <laughs> Threads, that's right. Well, thank you again for have uh, for coming on. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks so much. Well, Kristen, what did you learn today from oh, this episode? I learned about Barbie butts. That's that's one thing I learned. Tough to tailpipe. Tough to tailpipe. Not what I thought it was going to be. Endometrial prisons. Mm-hmm. 
It's a, 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 quite a pessimistic view. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly has a way with words. I love it. It's, it makes it's, it very memorable. And and definitely engaging. Like yes. <laughs> I I am definitely I'm going to be watching every single you video. You can see how he's gotten so many followers. It's very shareable. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so and and thank you for the stories and uh, for listening. Uh, there's lots of ways to reach out to us. If you have any stories, you have any guest ideas, you want to you want us to uh, anybody you want us to talk to. You can email us knock knock high at human-content.com. Uh, visit us on any of our social media uh, accounts. All the places. We're all the places. Uh, kick it with us and our human content podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at human content pods. Thank you to all the wonderful listeners leaving feedback and great reviews. If you like, like hear this on a, something that you can like, like please like do the like thing where you hit the like. Yeah. Hit like the like. It. Hit like the it. share. Do the like. Do the share. If you really like it. Do the follow. Leave us a review. All the things. Yeah. Can you, if you don't like it, just move along. Yeah. That's right. You don't have to listen to us ever <laughs> again if you don't want to. Um, yeah, but if you do leave a comment or subscribe on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube, we can give you a shout out. Like today at somebody else 6673 on YouTube said, I can't even imagine how this family could get any more wholesome. When the aliens ask who should represent Earth to the galaxy, I'm voting for the Glockenflecken. <laughs> Thank you so much. Very That's, nice. That is all I ask of you, <laughs> is that you you just let me represent humanity. To the alien. To the aliens who might want to destroy us. Mm. You know, they'll see me show up as the neurologist and they'll love it. It's going to be great. Um, just so don't show them your tufted tailpipe. Th- th- thank you for that. Uh, full video episodes of this podcast are up every week on my YouTube channel at D Glock and Flecken. We also have a Patreon. Lots of cool perks, bonus episodes where we react to medical shows and movies. We have something new we need to react to and film That's it right. and post it. Uh, you can hang out with other members of the Knock Knock High community. We're there. We're interacting. We're commenting. Early ad-free episode access, interactive Q&A, live stream events, a lot more patreon.com slash glockenflecken or go to glockenflecken.com speaking of patreon community perks new member shout out to beth heather s and angie m hello welcome knock knock hi that's that was lame wasn't it that was kind of lame anyway uh all right and shout out to all the jonathans we have a, a virtual head nod as always to patrick lucia c sharon s omar edward k Stephen G, Ross Box, Jonathan F, Marion W, Mr. Granddaddy, Caitlin C, Brianna L, Dr. J, Chaver W, Jonathan A, Leah D, K L, Rachel L, and P and Derek N. We just got to do a hangout with all the Jonathans. We did. So it was really fun to put some faces to name. Yeah, we got to we got to chat, ask each other questions, learn about our lives. It's it was it was we shared a lot of laughs too. That was it a was lot fun. of fun. My mom made an appearance. She sure did. Oh, did she? She did. Yeah, and we had a great time. She she loved it. We loved it. Uh, and everybody loved getting to hear more about my upbringing. childhood. Yes. <laughs> Patreon roulette time. So this is uh, goes to a, a random shout out to someone on the Jonathan tier of Patreon. Nope, emergency oh, medicine oh, emergency tier. Emergency medicine tier mm-hmm. of Patreon. Shout out to Karen B for being a patron. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for listening. We are your hosts, Will and Kristen Flannery, also known as the Glock and Fleckens. Special thanks to our guests today, Dr. Curran. Our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, and Shanti Brooke. Our editor and engineer is Jason Portiza. Our music is by Omar Benzvi. To learn about our Knock Knock Highs program disclaimer and ethics policy, submission, verification, licensing terms, and HIPAA release terms, you can go to glockandflecken.com or reach out to us knockknockhigh at human-constant.com for anything else you need from us. Uh, we're here for you. Knock Knock High is a human content production. Knock Knock, goodbye. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.